ridiculously complicated to try to bring it down to as concise as I could. So we got a lot of interesting things to talk about. I'm sure if you've dug up enough Harding information, at some point in your life you've heard of Gaston B. Means, and that's the man we'll be talking about today. And as it goes through, you're going to discover really quickly you don't understand why people keep trusting him and hiring him for more work. So we got to try to dig past the myths and the legends. That's the biggest, most difficult part of Gaston Means. Um, there's so many distorted truths, and they're all created by him. Uh, most of the time when anyone does research on Gaston Means, they'll use his own book, The Strange Death of President Harding, as the first uh, source. And he makes up so much stuff, and then future historians make up more stuff, it gets ridiculous. But he's kind of popped back up recently because of HBO's Boardwalk Empire. Up there on the left, you can see a picture of uh, the actor Stephen Root. He played Milton in Office Space, and he also did the voice of Bill in King of the Hill, in case you're curious. But um, he kind of played the role out, and Boardwalk Empire was not particularly friendly to the Hardings or most historical facts, honestly. They just kind of distorted it for the sake of a TV show. But they painted Gaston fairly accurately, a fast-talking man with a quick story uh, that panics when the story's not going right to try to make another lie and another lie and another lie. But they kind of take it in weird directions as well. But we need to start figuring out how it affects the Harding story as well. So figure out a little bit about where he's from. Gaston Means is born July 11th, 1879, Black Welder's Spring near Concord, North Carolina. He's the oldest of seven children. They were not real creative in naming their kids because we have Gaston, and he also has his brother Afton. So they, they apparently ran out of names very fast. Uh, he was nicknamed Bud as a child, but he comes from a very prominent family in Concord. His uh, grandfather, William Cresswell Means, is nicknamed the General. He's a prominent uh, cotton uh, plantation owner, or I guess it wouldn't be a plantation in North Carolina, it's more of a farm. But mo like most farmers in that day, once uh, slavery ended after the Civil War, for some reason his costs went up. I have no idea why. And uh, everything just started going south. But his son, the Colonel, William Gaston Means, they all had fun nicknames. None of them served in the military, but they just have the nicknames. The Colonel was a prominent lawyer in Concord. He was also the mayor of Concord for two separate occasions. And then there's also a little bit of fun relations. Uh, Gaston's uncle is Rufus Berenger. He's a general during the Civil War who's also the brother-in-law to Stonewall Jackson. So Gaston means through relations is actually associated with many members of the Civil War. But that just gives you a sense of where Concord is in relations to uh, North Carolina. And we started to start figuring out a little bit about Gaston as a child. Uh, you can start seeing some dastardly moments from him. There on the left is a photo of 139 Union Street North that still exists today. It's a private residence. Uh, always a refuge for Gaston Means during times of stress or pressure. Anytime things go bad, he goes back there. Uh, that's his boyhood home. The Means Boys, as his brothers and him were called in town, were known to be mean as hell. Gaston was six foot tall and 200 pounds as a teenager. He was a big old burly guy and scared the living daylights out of everybody. Um, and you can see some of these great quotes of him as a child. Uh, this was in a couple different versions that Gaston means as a child wanted money and stole it from his mother's purse and blamed it on the help in the house. And rightfully so, the mother believing her son fired the help. And Gaston Means, in various quotes, said that he claimed that his first memorable, satisfying experience was achieved not only by stealing money from his mother's purse, but also seeing the maid discharged for theft. And according to Gaston, in a quote for Liberty Magazine, uh, he had said, I think the sound of those coins in my pocket was the sweetest music I've ever heard. You start seeing, even as a child, he's got a little rough side to him. But uh, this is when it gets kind of goofy. Down here, the strange death of President Harding, again, this is made up stuff by Gaston for the most part, but you get little twinges of truth. Um, Gaston, as a kid, supposedly would help his father, who's a lawyer. Uh, he would uh, go around being his big, burly, 200-pound self and try to intimidate jurors for his father around town to side to side things. And also, he would sit around and listen to the other lawyers and witnesses talk in town, and people weren't paying attention. I don't know how they wouldn't notice this 200-pound guy just sitting there, but they didn't. 
and he thought it was fu great that, oh, how I thrilled at the scene like this. Who would have ever suspected that a 10-year-old boy sucking a stick of candy was a detective on the job? So he always um, embellishes himself to being this grand secret detective agent. It's, he, uh, he definitely builds himself up very, very easily. Now, he does attend the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He studies pre-law because the intention was that he was going to be a lawyer like his father. The problem was he was an extremely lazy student. Um, and you can find some photos of him. On the left, that's him with his frat brothers at Zeta Psi fraternity. And on the right, that's his junior class. That would be the last photo taken of him in UNC. Um, you can always tell by his big forehead and his big ears where he is in photos. It's the best way to spot him out. But um, he is well liked by his classmates and the frat brothers. They thought he was great. He was a very good schmoozer, very good talker. Just the problem is he, uh, he could never really commit himself to anything. He was on the football team for UNC Chapel Hill, but he was on their practice squad or their scrub squad as they called it. Uh, actually, the new coach booted him off when coaches switched because they said he was too lazy on the field. And he was a lineman. All he had to do was squat and stand up, and he couldn't even do that. <coughs> he only played in one football game. It was an exhibition game against the Deaf and Dumb Institute of Morgantown. They won that game 53-0. to zero. So shows you where that was, I guess. But very, uh, very interesting background while he was there. He was more concerned about other people, still thinking he was a detective. His frat brother said that they would find him in restaurants around town for hours, just watching people and jotting down notes about people, just making observations. Don't know why he did it, but he always did do that. Now, eventually, he's going to be disciplined for a minor offense at school. Don't know what it is. I did contact UNC, and... A lot of those files at this point, they have gotten rid of so many of these things. After 100 years, they don't keep every single person's student's records. But all they can tell me is that he wasn't expelled, but he never came back. Now, Gaston Means says that he graduated. There's no degree from UNC for him. Um, but it kind of, he bounces around. Uh, he doesn't, he leaves school in 1900. He says he left in 1901 degree, so take it for what it's worth. But from the best as I can tell, he never went back after Christmas break in 1900. So he moves on to bigger and better things instead. Supposedly, he became the superintendent of Abermale school, schools in North Carolina without being degreed. Of course, back then you can kind of move your way in there. But this is where it gets goofy. Gaston says he was a superintendent at the exact same time he was a uh, still in school full-time on the other side of the state, and also working for this, uh, this next man all at the same time. So you don't know which one's true or not. But he does find himself work working for James W. Cannon. That's the man up there on the left. James Cannon is a, the largest towel, a towel manufacturer in the world in 1900, 1900 big in cotton and uh, textiles. And uh, Gaston's father was his attorney, so he had a nice connection to work in there. And Gaston Means had worked a little bit in the mills during the summer between classes and all that type of stuff. But um, decided that this was going to be his opportunity to escape North Carolina because he didn't want to stay and be like his father or his grandfather. He thought this was going to be his opportunity to be exciting and go to New York and go to Chicago. And James Cannon was going to offer that opportunity. Now the Cannons supposedly, again according to Gaston Means, loved him, that Mr. J.W. Cannon, the multi-millionaire cotton manufacturer of Concord, North Carolina, knew my father well and he knew me. Mrs. Cannon said she always felt that her children were safe if Gaston Means were with them. Why Gaston Means was just hovering around James Cannon's children, I don't know. But Gaston believed it. Now this, we're going to start seeing Gaston being his uh, schemey self slowly. When between New York and Chicago, he uh, He's taking the train frequently going from town to town. And on uh, one of the platforms for the Pullman station, he actually fell off of the Pullman uh, platform, cracks his head open, and sues Pullman. He does settle. He gets money, and he's doing pretty good. Now, Lewis Graves, that's the gentleman down there on the, on the right. He's in his, the fraternity brother of gas and met up with him frequently through the rest of his life, said that after that, that incident, Gaston Means' personality changed drastically. He wasn't the same person. Um, the only thing that kind of throws it off a little bit is, is coincidentally about two weeks before he fell off the Pullman station, Gaston Means took three health insurance policies out in his name. 
and collected on all three after he fell off the tracks. So Gaston Means must have not been that messed up to have done that in the first place. And introduces us to our next player in this. This is Julie Patterson. This is Gaston's wife. And if you look at that photo, he kind of looks like Bozo the Clown standing next to her and leads to kind of an interesting dynamic between the two of them. Gaston has to leave New York for Chicago for a very important reason. He is, uh, he is actually taken to court for what's called a breach of promise suit. Breach of promise meaning he had supposedly proposed to a woman and broke the engagement off. And back in those days, the woman could actually take the, the man to court saying that financially she was expecting him to support her. This is thrown out in 1935 because the belief was that the diamond ring or whatever ring you would have gotten could have been exchanged for money, therefore you have some sort of financial backing. But back then, Gaston actually went to court and he had apparently proposed to a showgirl in New York and also gave her an STD. So she was pretty upset <coughs> and went to court. Gaston supposedly paid her an undisclosed sum and bolted New York City planning not to come back. So he goes to Chicago, start a new life and doing cotton work for James Cannon out there instead. And a friend of his says, hey, at this department store, there's this young girl that you really should meet. And he goes in there and starts acting like he's trying to sell her pantyhose from the James Cannon company. And this girl really isn't that interested in him, views him as an old portly man with a, the wrinkled forehead. She look, he looks too old for her. And he was older than her by about nine years. He asks her out three times, and eventually she gives up and says, okay, we'll, we'll go out, and is just wrapped up in this dramatic story of Gaston Means talking about how amazing he is and what he's doing, going to all the cities, and oh, she thinks it's absolutely amazing. And eventually she says that she just kind of succumbs. Her exact words was, all of a sudden I was in love with him. I was wild about him. And this is a very sheltered woman. She grew up in a uh, boarding, Catholic boarding school, um, in Missouri, and then she was shipped off to Chicago to live with her uncle. She never really experienced life. And then this man comes in with all sorts of stories, and she couldn't help but get wrapped into it. Now we have to also introduce another person briefly. Julie introduces Gaston to a woman named Maud King. Maud King is a very wealthy widow who loves Julie and takes her under her wings, saying that that's going to be her protege because Julie just looks up to her so much and says, oh, how amazing you are. I wish I could be like you. So Maud likes her. Maud's going to come back into play pretty soon, but this is we need to introduce her at some point. They have a rough marriage, uh, especially with children. They have a stillborn child in 1915. They have a, one more daughter named Julie that they kept on calling sister. She dies around age four, and they have one son, Billy. And Billy actually grows up to be a pretty significant alcoholic which leads me to another fella, well, fel a female fella, I guess. This is Julie Means Kane. She is Gaston Means' granddaughter. Uh, through research and hunting down people, I found her and had an opportunity to speak to her. Uh, she is 70 years old, a retired financial consultant. That, again, once we start learning more about Gaston Means, you're going to see the irony of that financial consultants is still in there with the Means. Um, and currently sells Swedish ceramics and plateware in upstate New York. Uh, so if you need that, please feel free to contact her. Uh, she has a different perspective on all these. I want to introduce some of those thoughts. I don't necessarily agree with them, but I want to propose what the granddaughter has to say about her grandfather and all that as well. Um, she is currently working on a book herself and trying to throw out some different theories that I'll introduce some of them. And as an agreement, I told her I'd put her little website up there. So if you'd like more uh, information, please feel free to go to juliemeanscane.com. But she is named Julie after her grandmother and her deceased aunt as well. So the family name is still sticking around. Well, Gaston Means, in July 1st, 1914, leaves the textile business. Uh, he tells Julie that's because he's not getting enough credit for his work. In truth, the company was about ready to fire him because he's going around from customers saying that he's John Cannon's son and therefore thinks that he can get more business that way. So he bolts and finds new work elsewhere, and he finds Mr. Bill Burns. Uh, that's him on the right there. Bill Burns is considered the Sherlock Holmes of America back then. He caught the people that were responsible for bombings in Los Angeles. 
uh, which got him a lot of fame. He also owned a private detective agency in New York, and Gaston knocks on his door and says, you need to hire me and let me tell you why. I know how to get information from people. I've been doing this since I was a kid, helping my father, and oh, it's great. And then he throws out ideas that you should offer a bank protection plan, that if you're, something goes sour with the banks, Bill Burns can help you. Don't know how Bill Burns was going to help you, but he said he could. And he also proposed uh, what he called a, mo a monthly motor club where people could pay him every single month to have auto theft investigated if your car got stolen, which is a pretty big scam because if your car never gets stolen, you just keep on paying Bill Burns to supposedly be ready to do it. Bill Burns hires him, thinks it's great that this fast-talking kid is ready to go, and offers him a job. He gets paid 25 bucks a week plus new client commissions. So modern day pay, 619 bucks a week. He's making about 32 grand a year, which is not a terrible salary, honestly. Um, and he's put to work investigating German shipping lines first. Bill Burns put him out there to see if America, well, if, to help prove the United States is violating neutrality law. Right now, World War One's going on. We're neutral in the whole uh, escapade out in, New in Europe, but Germany, and Britain both want to prove that the United States is somewhat involved still. So he's putting Gaston out there, and Gaston's going to try to help prove that we're not violating it. But then he finds out that he can make some money. <coughs> so that leads us to scheme number one. Gaston is actually going to be hired by the German government to be a spy. And this is from him being investigating whether the neutrality laws he comes into contact with Captain Carl Boy Ed, and that's the gentleman on the right. He's the head of German espionage in the United States. He's attached to the German embassy. And uh, eventually he's going to be removed from the by the U.S. government in 1915 because they discover, hey, this is the head of a spy ring. He sh probably shouldn't be here. But Gaston, to try to sum up the whole thing, is going and trying to hi get people hired in naval ports that are pro-German to help prove that the British were violating neutrality laws. So he's planning little, I guess, slug employees to try to mess things up. And then even further than that, Gaston Means actually starts hiring men to supposedly deliver boats, crates of boats worth of stuff, out to another boat in the ocean, not knowing where they're delivering it to. Turns out it's a British ship, and he's trying to prove, see, we're violating neutrality laws. So he's setting these things up, and Carl Boyed's paying him for all of his hard work. And uh, it's just is a really sticky mess. And Gassamine starts getting in the news. He loves it. He holds press conferences in his hotel that he's living in weekly, and he's telling everyone that he's pro-peace. He's trying to help prove that the United States needs to stay neutral. But honestly, he's just trying to make money. And I realize it's very complicated and convoluted trying to figure it out. Um, but trying to sum it up as best I can can be very difficult. So he's going to continue working for the Germans. And meanwhile, that's not good enough for him. He's going to move on to the next scheme, scheme number two. He goes back to Maud King that we spoke about previously. That's the woman on the top left there. Maud King is kind of a ditzy woman that falls in love too much. She was married three times. Uh, the second marriage to a man named uh, James King, that's the gentleman on the right, who's a lumber baron with a net worth of $4 million. Today it's worth about $90 million. She gets in there. And makes and marries him. She gets a lump sum when he dies, and basically from there she starts falling in love with other guys that sees he's rich and tries to take her money. Now, Maud King's sister, her name is Mary Melvin. She's actually in the picture on the bottom left on the right of the three women. It's a wonderful photo, I know, but that's the best one I could find. And to her right, and the on the picture on the right is Mrs. Robinson. That is Maud King's mother. Um, Basically, the family's getting nervous that Maud King's going to lose all of her money because the rest of the family is living off of Maud King giving them money. <laughs> and through no, Maud King and the sister knowing Julie Means says, hey, your husband, he works for a detective agency. Can he help? And Gaston Means gets his foot in the door. And over enough course of hard work, and he helps, he gets Maud King away from these other people trying to steal her money convinces her to sue and get more money for the estate and basically becomes her financial planner. And they trust her. And he gets her to sign over power of attorney to him. 
and bleeds her dry. Uh, he spends her money on the stock market. Uh, they are living in these elaborate hotels and um, apartments in New York City. Uh, basically, he's spending $9,000 a year on an apartment. Today, that's $203,000 a year on an apartment that he's living in with Maude King, his family, and Mrs. Robinson, trying to keep them all together. And he's also spent, uh, again, Maude King's money, uh, $6,000 for artwork and furnishings for his apartment. That's $361,000 today of money that's not his. And they're all living together, and he also plays poker against her weekly, and she's bad at poker, and he steals money from her that way, too. Well, basically, at that point, they're out of money. He spent it all, and he goes and creates a second will, and he convinces Maude King this second will exists, and if this will exists, you're going to get all of the four, $4 million. You're going to get it all, uh, or I guess at this point, it would have been $2 million, I, I should say. And the belief was that if he could get it to happen, Gaston Means would receive $950,000 of that $2 million that she would get. So he's fighting hard to prove that this fake will is real because that would net him, again, today's money, $21.4 million today. Uh, so Gaston now has to fight the Northern Trust Company who holds the balance of this, uh, this estate. And he spends more of King's money to prove that this will is real. So everyone's bleeding dry. And eventually they start realizing things aren't working. Uh, Gaston is taking Mod King out of Chicago, going down to Concord, North Carolina, where he knows the turf and they're going to be safe down there. And he's trying to keep her away from other lawyers and the bank and all that type of stuff. And while down there, uh, she's getting restless and Gaston says, hey, let's go have a picnic. We need to have a picnic. Let's go out. I'll show you where we can go. By the way, let's bring these guns with us in case we see rabbits. You know, that'd be fun. And they go out, and Maud King accidentally shoots herself in the back of the head. Don't know how it happened. It's a miracle. On the right is the, the actual newspaper write-up explaining his whole uh, ordeal. And sum, summing it all up, he says that we were walking, and she was afraid of the guns. And that trying to keep her safe, he takes the gun away from her and sticks it in the the crux of a tree, that's the little V-shaped tree that the man is pointing to in that photo. And he says he was thirsty and had to walk to a spring. That's why you have the other guy bent over reenacting drinking from a spring farther down the photo. And while he was turned drinking from the spring, she accidentally shot herself in the back of the head with the, with the gun and falls dead. So everyone's in trouble now. His brother claims that he saw her spinning the gun on her finger over top of her head. But at, at this point, the whole story is all ridiculously messed up. And uh, so Maude King's dead. And this starts hitting massive news because this is a rich woman that has been murdered. And the family, his, her mother-in-law starts going after him saying, you murdered my daughter. This becomes a massive national headline grabber. And you can see various examples of newspaper. There was My favorite was the one up top that Someone did a psychoanalysis based off of his photo because he had a big forehead to prove that he was up to no good. And the bottom right, I love the caricature of him leaning over the desk trying to uh, force the woman into signing things over. Oh, they, they built it up so, so much. But in the end, he's actually found, uh, he's acquitted for murdering her in a North Carolina court in Concord because of a couple different things. His father's well known in town, he's known in town, uh, accidentally, they put two of Gaston's extended family members on the jury. And uh, <laughs> three, the locals felt like all these big city lawyers fighting for Maud King were trying to harass a local. So they all sided with Gaston, and they acquitted him of it. So Gaston Means is done, ready to go. So he's found not guilty, but he still wants that money. So now he's going to help a Maud King's sister get this money. So he's going to still push for this second will that he created and faked. So we're going to keep on pushing. Well, he needs to get his name cleaned up because, well, everyone knows he may have murdered someone. That's not looking so good. So he offers to the government, and this is scheme number three, if I help you to the government, the Justice Department, write me a letter saying that you know I'm of good standing and I want to help America. And he offers them a uh, trunk full of German spy papers that he had when he worked for the Germans. And everyone says, that's great, let's do it. And he sends a trunk to the, uh, the government official that was supposed to receive it. 
And when they open it, the trunk's empty. And he says, someone stole all the papers out of there. I had them in there. I had them in there. And he blames the United States government, and then he turns around and blames the German government. So everyone's stealing these papers, and it's just getting ugly and ugly and ugly. And he never gets the letter he was hoping for for the government to say, hey, you're a good guy, because honestly, he wasn't. Um, but keeps on going anyway. The trial for this second will to try to get this thing passed happens between August and December of 1920. And it basically just dies because people are realizing this will is not real and Gaston can only push so far. The lawyer, the judge, Jesse A. Baldwin, that's his photo there next to the headline, says, no fair consideration of this case can ignore the fact that Gaston B. Means is shown to be a controlling and dominating spirit in the attempt to establish this will. Indeed, the conclusion is irresistible that Mrs. King and Mrs. Melvin, that's the sister, were singularly under the influence and were largely dominated by a strong personality and inflexible will. So they're throwing out this second will, and Gaston's pretty much out of luck, and he realizes that. But he owes money to Mrs. Melvin's lawyers as well. So he says, I, I definitely I'm going to send you the money. Brings down some friends to the Southeastern Express Company, similar to an Ameri um, uh, oh, I can't think of the name, the uh, telegram company that you would be sending funds to. Thank you, Western Union. Goes down there proves that he's putting $57,000 into an envelope, hands it over, and they send it up. The lawyer, Roy Keane, knows Gaston Means and doesn't trust him, pulls all of his employees together when they open the magic envelope, and inside there's absolutely nothing. Gaston Means is shocked. Where did my $57,000 go? And he says he's going to sue the Southeastern Express Company. Southeastern Express says, okay, we'll investigate. And once they say that they don't think there was any money in there, they said, you're welcome to pursue. And Gaston Means gave up because he realized he was going to get nowhere fast. So again, we're seeing a shysty person, but we're just starting up. He's now going to seize an opportunity at what I consider normalcy. He sees war, uh, the Harding administration come in. Uh, the, the Department of Justice, at this point, they have the Bureau of Investigation, the precursor to the FBI. And it's new director is Bill Burns, Gaston Means' former employer. And Bill Burns is trying to set up this bureau like he did in New York City. He wants tough guys that are going to go in and not take a no for an answer and rough up people and get, get the results that he wants. And Gaston's just the guy he needs for that. Now, interestingly enough, Bill Burns is also going to be running his, uh, his own detective agency at the exact same time as being the head of the bureau house. So it's a little bit of a conflict of interest as well. But um, Gaston gets hired on by his former employer. He's going to make uh, 88 bucks a week. Today, if you put it all together, he's making a salary of 61,360 bucks a year in modern money. So he's doing really good. He's assigned to investigate bread prices and, wa and war fraud claims because they felt that his experience with the Germans could help deal with the aftermath of World War I. Um, and when he's here, he starts meeting a new network of people. Now, the Justice Department is known for being slimy at this point. Up top, there is Harry Doherty, the Attorney General, who's Warren's, uh, Warren Harding's campaign manager. And he, does, he has a bit of a sordid history himself. But while there, Gaston meets Jessie Duxton. That's the woman down on the bottom right. She's the first, one of the first two female agents of the Bureau of Investigation. She starts as a secretary to Bill Burns and moves into an actual agent. And he also meets attorney Sidney Bieber. Bieber is a slimy guy around D.C. that knows slimy people and introduces Warren to Clark Greer, who's also a slimy guy. And Clark Greer knows bootleggers. So Gaston Means hires Clark Greer to go hunt down bootleggers and tell, him, tell them, you're in trouble, get a hold of Gaston Means. You give him enough money, he'll take care of your problems. So we're up to scheme or schemes number five. He starts offering protection to bootleggers. Now, this can be in many forms. He says that if you have a, if the government goes after you, you pay me enough money, I'll make it go away. Or I'll give you liquor permits. Liquor can be produced. You just can't sell it. You can't drink it. You can't do all that. Well, you can drink it privately. But he can get you legal permits to be able to move liquor from one town to the other. So you're legally allowed to take as much liquor as you want and move it to your own places. He can make charges disappear. He also promises high profile jobs to people. He promised to two to three people that you can be the head 
of the prohibition units in Chicago and New York City. He had no power to do that, but he promises it. And he never delivers. He takes all these money, this money and he doesn't have to deliver because who are they going to tell? They're not going to go to the government or the police and say, I just got stuck on this and I paid this guy money to help me get out of charges. It's not going to happen. Now, along this lines, his name's getting brought up in the Department of Justice, and he is going to be suspended from the department on February 9th, 1922. But he keeps his office there. For some reason, Bill Burns lets him have his spot. So he keeps on inviting bootleggers to the Department of Justice in his office and says, see, I'm working here. Keep on giving me money. And people are believing him along the lines. Now, the man on the right there, that's George Remus. He's a lawyer and a bootlegger out of Cincinnati, uh, very well known. And he promises George Remus, if you give me $250,000, which modern money is $2.9 million, I can make your charges disappear. And George Remus tells his, this is his story of meeting Gaston Means. I met Means by appointment at the office of the Department of Justice at Washington. He showed me the file of the department in regard to myself and that time try, uh, and that, that time tried to impress me and did impress me is what he could do. He told me at the time that he could handle anyone in the department in any matter, regardless of what it was, from the Attorney General down, down, including Mr. Burns. So he made a lot of promises. George Remus didn't trust him and didn't do it. And George Remus goes to jail. But this is where you can kind of see how he op op operates, saying that I'm here, I can take care of any one of your problems. Leads us to another fellow. And I know this is all complicated and a lot of people, but you can kind of see how he builds his web and network. This is Elmer Jernecki. He's the man on the right covering his face. At that point, it looks like he's just embarrassed being next to Gaston. But that's the best photo I could find of him. He's uh, got little to no education. He actually used to sell chickens and eggs in uh, Chicago. And he becomes the go-between for Gaston. Uh, he'll be the man that talks to the bootleggers on behalf of Gaston. And he loves Gaston. He thinks this guy's amazing because he comes and tries to do some business with him. Elmer sends a, a letter to his friend Samuel Schmidt saying uh, on a prospective deal with Gaston. And I just like the, so hustle, oh boy, I brought you the bacon, so it's up to you to fry it and get them to me. Let all your other business go to hell, for this is where we will shine. Elmer's enthralled by him. Problem is, Elmer's not that good. He's not that bright. Elmer writes letters that people can find saying, look, we're doing bootlegging deals, yay. Elmer also writes receipts that he signs to bootleggers <laughs> saying that we're accepting money. <laughs> Not one of better decisions, but I think uh, Gaston liked kind of having the slow guy underneath him that could become his patsy and kind of the fall guy as well. Let's move on to scheme number six, because all this is happening at the same time. He just moves from one job to another to another to another to try to steal as much money as he can. This moves to the next man, Thomas Felder. That's him on the top right there. He's a local lawyer in Washington, D.C., very corrupt, very slimy. And the two of them commit fraud. Well, help. I guess I backtrack. There's a company called the Glass Casket Company of Altoona, Pennsylvania. Down on the bottom right is an example of a glass casket. This company is trying to sell these caskets to the population, saying that if something happens to your family member, we don't have to exhume them. We just have to unbury the casket and you can absorb, uh, observe the body and we can take care of all these things. And people were really interested in it at that time. Problem was business wasn't good. And this company starts sending letters to prospective investors saying, hey, give us money. We're doing great. We're doing great. But they weren't. And they end up taking money in fraudulently. And the government comes after them saying that you are fraudulently putting these things in the mail. This is a federal offense. We're coming after you. All these problems. And they come to Gaston Means. And Gaston says, oh, if you hire me and give me $65,000 and hire my buddy Thomas Felder here, we'll make all your problems go away. And this company believed him. And according to Elmer Jernecki, Gaston, there was this big back and forth between this people, this company, and Gaston of whether they were going to give the money or not. And they thought they were being overcharged. According to Elmer Janecki, Gaston in this secret meeting space yelled, my supervisor has raised cane with me on account that letting this go so cheap. It should have been $165,000, but I have told you 65000 and it stands at sixty-five. So he gets his money. Oddly enough, he can't make the charges disappear. And the glass ca casket company heads end up getting charged, and they actually do end up going to jail eventually. 
All right. Well, things are catching up with Gaston slowly. And the Justice Department finally goes after Means and Jernecki, saying that we know you're doing some goofy things here. The biggest problem that ran into it was at one point, Gaston Means tries to stick two people that are buddies with the Secretary of Treasury, Andrew Mellon. And they tell Andrew Mellon, Andrew Mellon starts getting mad and they start keeping tabs of him in records. And coincidentally, they also have a signed receipt from Elmer Janecki that says, yes, we're doing bootlegging and uh, illegal things with you. So <coughs> Means and Janecki are going to be charged. Means is going to be charged with over 100 violations of the Volstead Act. That's against prohibition. And they bring in a district attorney, Hiram C. Todd. That's the gentleman up top. And um, Todd is brought in because he's quick, he's efficient, he's a straight arrow, and Doherty doesn't want to be involved in this case. That's the attorney general bringing him in. Because Thomas Felder, Gaston Means attorney, at one point had hired Ga uh, Harry Doherty's son, Draper, that's the man on the r bottom right, and got him out of trouble. And Felder always thought he could pull that out as an ace in the hole if he ever got in trouble with the government. And so Doherty's trying to stay as far, far away as he possibly can. This trial to go after Means and Jernecki is set for December 1923. And Felder gets them to push it back, saying, I'm not feeling well. Can we just wait? Then Means says, I'm not feeling well. Can we wait? And they wait till the next year. It was going to be January 1924 that they were going to actually go for the trial. But at that exact same time, people are going after Harry Doherty. And Gaston Means jumps up and says, I'll be a star witness against Harry Doherty, who's going after me in another trial. And the government, uh, the Department of, uh, or the Congress brings him in as a star witness to go after the Department of Justice. So he's getting out of one court trial to move to another court trial. Uh, so this thing's really convoluted. So he's now going to be a star witness against the Department of Justice who's going after him. Senator Burton Wheeler, that's the gentleman on the top right, is going after Doherty and the Department of Justice in particular. That's his goal. And means, again, is a star witness. Testimony begins on March 1924. So his other trial is pushed back. And he's hoping this will get him immunity if he helps the government. So Gaston Means promises that I have these well-kept diaries. I'll give them to you. And apparently that's considered perfect evidence. If I have these diaries I wrote, which he doesn't have. He actually hires two stenographers, his father-in-law and himself, to sit down and write fake journal entries for to a tale three years. Um, and this is where this trial when he's brought on the stands where we're going to start seeing a lot of the stories that Gaston Means makes up that he's working personally for the Hardings and that how he's stealing money and it's this I have a secret fishbowl in a hotel room and bootleggers come and put money and I stand in the other room looking through a peephole and that's how I know the money's in there he's telling all these drawn out elaborate stories and he starts talking about how Harry Doherty's personally getting money and Jess Smith his associate that's the man on the right is also personally getting money, and none of this is true, but everyone's loving the story. And this is when it just starts getting, Gaston is in his element, and he's, you see him smirking at cameras up there in the top right in the courtroom, and I like that picture of Burton Wheeler, he's got his cigar and his little action figures, and he's just kind of sitting there enjoying himself. But they're going to question means, Wheeler brings, uh, this is trial testimony right here, Wheeler says, and have you ever been convicted of a felony? Means his answer, I've been accused of every crime in the catalog, but not convicted so far. I have never been convicted, but have been charged with every crime. Oh, I have been convicted once or twice for minor fights. How is that? I've been in the mayor's court for hitting some fellow or some fellow hitting me and licking me, perhaps or otherwise, or sometimes like that, but I have never called that anything. Wheeler's response, what is your business at the present time? Means is answering indictments. So he's making this a show. All right. So we're up to the next part that they said, OK, you have these diaries. Show us these diaries. We need these. And Gaston Means says, OK, we'll get you the diaries. Problem is, Gaston Means is promising that there's a letter from Warren Harding and Florence Harding in his testimony, uh, in his files, which doesn't exist. And a few other papers that don't exist. So he has to make these letters disappear. <laughs> and he ends up while he's conferring as a witness to the Senate committee, stealing, he steals letterhead from the office. And he forges letters from the one senator on this committee. His name is Smith Brookhart. He's there on the left. And forges this letter saying that Mr. Brookhart sent men over to pick up the letters, or the, the diary entries. 
and that's why they're gone. Well, I don't know where they are. You, you said you were going to pick them up. I don't know where they are. And they said, well, you need to show us these, this letter immediately. And on the right, you can see that is the, a copy of the letter. And underneath is Smith Brookhart actually writing a response saying, this is not my signature. And I don't even have a typewriter like this in my office. So it's starting to get a little goofy. Now, later on, Gastamine's personal secretary, her name's Rella Lane, in a testimony says that Gaston asked her to type this letter. And in her exact words, he's, he told her, these letters will keep me out of the penitentiary, which didn't really work out. But in the middle, I just want to point out so you can see some geographic things where that point is, that little red arrow is where Gaston Means' house is at the time. He lives about three blocks away from the White House. <laughs> so he's really close to the action back then. So at this point, Gaston thinks he has his way out of not having to produce these letters. And he's saying that Hiram Ty, the Justice Department, stole them. That's where they are. They're coming after me. I'm a victim. I'm a victim. Well, Hiram Todd's pretty ticked off. He comes swooping in saying that I, I'm going to defend myself of what's going on. So Todd goes on the stand, and they actually start going after him like he's the aggressor, and Gaston means he's the poor victim. An example, this is one man that was on the uh, committee. His name is Henry Ashurst. He's the man on the top left. First senator for the state of uh, Arizona, also nicknamed the silver-tongued sunbeam of the painted desert. <coughs> he was known for talking a lot. Um, prime example, trying to pass the 19th Amendment, which is women's rights to vote, he got up and gave a three-hour speech saying how we need to pass this and talk so long that they ran out of time to vote. And they had to postpone it for another week. <coughs> but Ashurst is going after Hiram Todd, and again, viewing him as the aggressor against poor Gaston Means. Ashurst basically is trying to secure what Hiram Todd means, and he feels that Todd's dodging the question. Ashurst says, you are a lawyer, as you know, Mr. Darty employed Mr. Burns, do you not? And you also know that Mr. Darty knew that Mr. Burns employed Mr. Means. Now, don't be dodging and twisting. Just tell me right out. Todd says, I am not trying to dodge and twist, and don't insinuate that I am. Asher's response, I am not insinuating. I am charging. I do not insinuate. I charge. Gaston Mean likes that. That's why he's smiling about it. <laughs> he is just brimming ear to ear, seeing all this stuff being drugged around, and he's just looking awesome right now and he's loving every minute and he thinks this is going to give him his opportunity to get out of all these troubles problem is it doesn't really work out that way Darty resigns his post of attorney general so the government doesn't really have a reason to go after him anymore so they drop they start moving on from the case they tell gas means we don't need you anymore by the way we're not going to give you immunity and they send him back to finish up his case that was being charged against him for liquor deals now, Gast the court case begins June 17th, 1924, and Gaston Means starts doing everything again, making up stories. He says that W.T. Underwood, a man that worked for Secretary Andrew Mellon, and that's the man in the top right who looks shocked at this allegation, <laughs> says that Underwood works for Mellon. Mellon gave Underwood money to give money to Means to take care of problems. Uh, and so did Mr. Fatkin, which is another great name that all these people are working together and they're paying means for Mellon. The problem is that Gaston Means has no way of contacting them. They don't have a dress. They're not going to respond to anybody. In fact, they might be dead. And people are just starting to get really drawn up by this. Hiram Todd in the courtroom says, the world is losing a great fact of fictionalist, especially fictionalist, by keeping Means so busy with investigations. Let him have some leisure so he may write. As his first great work, we suggest a book entitled The Adventures of Gaston B. Means Among the Bootleggers, or Conspiracy with the Rum Runners by the Old Man Himself Means. <laughs> so they're starting to point out this man is lying. He's got to be. And finally, they agree. So Gaston Means is found guilty along with his associate, Elmer Janecki. Both are given two years in jail. Gaston is giving a $10,000 fine. Janecki's giving a $5,000 fine, and up top you see them being escorted to the prison, the Tombs Prison in New York City, where they're being tried. Uh, Means gets out on $25,000 bail. Janecki has no money, and Gaston Means it refuses to help his buddy, and that was a big mistake. The IRS seizes an opportunity and says, hey, what do you know, Gaston Means made all this money from bootlegging. He owes us back taxes and goes after him for $267,614.40. Uh, Modern-day money, the government is looking for $3.7 million from Gaston Means. 
uh, means has no intention of paying that. Uh, basically, they go to the next court round, they try to go for appeals, and Gaston Means looks like he might actually get off because there's just not enough information proving him. Jernecki looks like the dirty one, not him. But he didn't help his buddy Jernecki. Jernecki gets mad, and the government basically convinces him to turn on Means. And Jernecki becomes this prime witness, and then all the people that he's stuck over in the glass casket company becomes defendant witnesses, and Gaston Means loses everything. Jernecki is gonna be pardoned uh, later on that year, and actually the glass casket company people are also pardoned for helping against Gaston Means. So because of that, the government decides, the uh, judge decides that Gaston Means should serve an additional two years and another $10,000 fine. So that's a total of four years and $20,000. And he's gonna be shipped to the Atlanta Penitentiary, that's it on the bottom right, and he's gonna be there from May 1924 to July 1928. He's considered a model, pr a, a model prisoner. He uh, works in the record office and he's a gardener. Uh, when a reporter asks him while he's in, right before he goes to jail what he was going to do with his future, his response, anybody I can. <laughs> and Gaston Means is going to spend out some time there. Well, we need to move on to another scheme because that's just not enough. <laughs> so while in, while in jail, he meets a woman, May Dixon Thacker. She is the wife of the chaplain for the prison, and she's kind of trying to move in as a writer as well. Now, uh, Gaston Means' granddaughter, who I spoke to, uh, can't stand this woman. She describes her as a quack, a terrible writer, doesn't know what she's doing, and tries to kind of spin that maybe she had more embellishing than Gaston, but that's a whole nother mess. She's a part-time writer and offers, after meeting Gaston, to write a story, because this is just a sensational story of all the things he says he's done. And Means just keeps on filling her with lie after lie after lie, and she believes every bit of it. This is where we're going to see the story that Florence poisoned Warren Harding. Gaston Means makes it up. He claims that Florence would meet with him and she was just crazy. Uh, as this quote that comes from the book, uh, this is describing a meeting between uh, Gaston and Florence. Florence says to him, I shall stand on the summit, mark what I tell you, the world may never really know what one woman with a will of iron has accomplished. What was she talking about? The woman must be crazy, I thought, but yet I knew she was not. Her lips tightened and again she clasped and unclasped her fingers. She repeated, you will know, you will know. He paints Florence as a psychotic and claims that he, she poisoned Warren. Not true, Warren died of a heart attack. But people start believing it. Uh, May Dixon Thacker will get this book published, which oddly enough, they actually approached Nan Britton and her, uh, and her Aunt Elizabeth Guild, Elizabeth Ann Guild, to publish the book, and she turned it down. But uh, Nan Britton's publisher and uh, advertising agent said this is a great opportunity and started his own publishing firm and put it out. So Nan Britton's actually remotely attached to this book as well. Uh, this book goes out, it's a bestseller. It's also internationally published. You can see the French version on the left there, La Extrana Muerte del Presidente Harding. Or maybe it's Spanish, that sounds more Spanish. But the <laughs> Yeah, but the laws sound French, I like that. So we're gonna go with that. It's not, it's not United States English, I know that. And you got the copy of the book there on the right. So eventually, the story comes out that she starts realizing, Mae Dixon Thacker starts realizing it's not true. And she's been duped. She writes and publishes a repudiation in the Saturday Evening Post saying, I didn't know that I was being hoodwinked by this. And it goes out, but it's too late. Everything's been out. Now, according to Julie Means Kane, the granddaughter, she had told me that her grandmother said that Gaston and Julie, the grandparents, would sit together every morning and have breakfast and think of what lies they could tell May Dixon Thacker. So they would meet her two times a week, three times a week, so over coffee, say, well, what can we convince her of this time? And she believed it every single time. So this is gonna earn him a considerable sum of money, but that's not enough. We need to move to scheme number eight. Gaston Means finds his next job. He works for Ralph Easley. He's the executive director of the National Civic Federation. This is a pro-worker and anti-communist group. They're trying to hunt down communists that are hurting the unions. That's the, uh, Easley's the man on the left there with the big bushy mustache. Now Gaston sells himself as a communist hunter and an expert. Easley says, How, can you prove that you're this excellent hunter? He says, sure, I'll, I'll show you this Russian secret agent that I know. And takes him to the Library of Congress and points out 
Walter Lidget, that's the man on the top right, says this is a communist leader and you need to watch out for him. Lidget is just a newspaper journalist that happened to be there that day reading a newspaper. But easily believes him, hires him and says, I'm going to pay you a salary and I'm going to pay all your expenses. Hunt down these communists for us. Jackson takes advantage of it and starts traveling the country with his family. He goes to Chicago hunting communists who happen to be going to amusement parks that he's going to take his son to and happens to be dining at the nicest restaurants in Chicago. And then they go to Detroit. They go to Niagara Falls because the communists are there at, during the spring. It's a beautiful time to be communist. <laughs> they go to Vancouver. Then it gets, you know, it's getting a little cold, so the communists move to Los Angeles. They go to Mexico during the winter. And coincidentally, the president of Mexico got shot by assassins. And Gaston says, see, 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 the communists are here after all. And this entire time, all he's doing is reading the newspaper and copying what he finds out in newspapers and sends it to this Ralph Easley saying, see, this is what I'm finding. And he's believing him. Then Easley eventually says, I need you to come back and prove to me that you're still hunting communists. So he comes back to New York and says, well, you need to prove to me that you're still finding these communists. And he says, sure, I'll show you. And he takes them and says, look, I found Swedish communist Niels Jorgensen and points him out. And that's supposed of Niels Jorgensen on the bottom right there, who is a friend of Gaston Means is named Norman Whitaker. And easily believes him again and lets it go. So over a course of a year, year and a half, Gaston's going to spend $200,000 of the National Civic Federation's money, $2.8 million today. So it's getting pretty ugly. Norman Whitaker, who is his friend, is actually another schemer who's known for stealing cars. He's also a guy that puts slugs into pay phones to get money out of them. Um, and he's also an international chess champion. <coughs> All right, so we got our money. We're good. Now we got to move on to the next scheme. It's not enough. Uh, Charles Lindbergh, national hero, flew the spirit of St. Louis. Uh, for those of you not aware, his uh, two-year-old son, Charles Lindbergh Jr., is kidnapped March 1st, 1932, uh, and it's national sensation that we need to find Colonel Lindbergh's son. Uh, Gaston seizes an opportunity. That's his house in Chevy Chase, Maryland, in the top right. That's Gaston Means' house, and supposedly sat in the living room, read the newspaper, and said, ah, I need to do something about this immediately, and basically says, let's see what money I can make. So using connections to get a hold of Evelyn Walsh McLean. She is a rich heiress, friends of the, the um, Lindberghs. She's also the woman that had the Hope Diamond. That's one of her claims to fame. Good friend of Florence Harding as well. Uh, Gaston Means is able to get a hold of her because of Jesse Duxton. That was the woman I talked about at the beginning in the FBI. He, her husband was the private secretary of Evelyn's husband, Ed McLean. So he had a perfect opportunity to get on in there says, I know what happened because those guys that kidnapped the kid came talk to me and said, do you want to help us? And I said, no, because I'm such a good guy. And Evelyn starts believing him, saying, oh, this is, you, you know what's going on. We need to take care of this. And Gaston sucks her into this intrigue. And Evelyn isn't necessarily the smartest woman on earth either, let's be very honest, and starts believing all these stories. And Gaston makes this thing an exciting adventure with code names and numbers, and she loves it. So he convinces Evelyn that he talks to the kidnappers, and if you give me $100,000 and a Catholic priest, because the priest has to be there, uh, we can give this to the kidnappers, and they'll give you the baby back. Well, supposedly the, the drop-off didn't happen properly, and Evelyn can't handle it, so Gaston has to take over. And that's because Evelyn is visited by a man calling himself the Fox. And he comes in snarling, angry, saying that I'm going to, I know you're, you're trying to steal the baby from us. We need money, and I'm serious. The fox happens to be Norman Whitaker, the man on the right there that we talked about. That was Gaston Means' his friend. And the fox says, you better give me the money or the baby will die. And Evelyn gets all scared, talks to Gaston Means. And Gaston says, let's go to El Paso, Texas, because I know that the baby's over the border in Mexico. So they go down there. And Evelyn's paying the bill. He goes down there and says, you know what? The kidnappers aren't happy. You need to give me another $35,000. That's the only way we can handle this. And Evelyn starts believing it again. And eventually, Evelyn's friend says, stop giving this man money. This is stupid. And they get a hold of the FBI. They start hunting down to see how truthful Gaston is. And they realize he's not, <laughs> surprisingly. So Gaston's going to be arrested by the FBI by May 5th. So this is a course of uh, almost two months. 
And now we're going to go into the next sensational trial of Gaston Means stealing essentially $135,000 from Evelyn Walsh McLean. And where's the money? And Gaston Means is sitting in jail, reading his newspapers, enjoying every minute of it. So trying to sum up a little bit, there's two different trials. One on June 8, 1923, the next one April 29, 1933. Gaston's going to be found guilty on both of these. Uh, Norman Whitaker is going to be pulled in a little bit as well. And essentially, they, they're going to put Gaston in, in jail for 17 years. This is going to be a giant um, escapade. People are going to follow it in the news. You see Gaston in the top left looking triumphant for the photos, pointing his fingers up that he knows that God's on his side. On the right, there's, he's talking to all the reporters, which actually is interesting. You see the woman beat reporter sitting there as well. And that's Gaston smiling, walking with his wife to the courtroom in the middle. Uh, he shows no fear or remorse. Newsweek magazine says he was the perfect picture of a man enjoying the crowd at his own hanging. <laughs> and that leads us to, again, you can see various examples of newspaper articles. Let's see if this will let me bring it up. Oh, come on. I see why I put this in here. That's not what I wanted. Well, I guess it'll still play. It's very quiet. Oh, come on. There we go. So you can see that Gaston B. Means is on trial for the Lindbergh hoax. This is talking about that Charles Lindbergh is going to fly across the country to be able to be a witness. Another great scene that the Lindbergh himself spoke against Gaston Means. And there's Evelyn looking all distraught, and Gaston looking very happy with his chubby cheeks. But Gaston, again, very calm, sees as an opportunity to speak. That's something else. And this quick little one, these pathy newsreels, they only show him for like three seconds. I don't care about this. <laughs> I had it embedded, but apparently they didn't want to stick in there for us. Oh, come on. There we go. So here we are at the courthouse, and we're talking about Lindbergh again, marching in to be a witness against Gaston Means. And this is, I, I love this, that they're saying that he's going to be found guilty. And here comes Gaston, smiling, and that's Norman Whitaker trying to hide his face. <laughs> yep. And, that's, and there's Lindbergh triumphantly coming back out of the courtroom. But these are little newsreels showing it that everyone's interested in what's going on. Now, J. Edgar Hoover is now the head of the FBI. He had brought on these trials and the charges against Gaston. And Hoover is going to later write, for, uh, write a story for a couple of different magazines talking about how he was the most dastardly fellow he ever investigated and most interesting. And according to Hoover, afterwards, Means looked at him in the courtroom and said, how would you like the story? Hoover says, in all my life, I've never heard a wilder yarn. Means' his answer, well, it was a good story, just the same, wasn't it? Now, According to Edwin Hoyt, who did write a, a fairly good book about Gaston Means called The Spectacular Rogue, uh, put in as kind of a lighthearted joke, which I enjoyed. His, uh, Gaston says, his lighthearted assurance that he wouldn't sue the Bureau of Investigation for false arrest was wasted on J. Edgar Hoover, who had him locked up. <laughs> so Gaston's going to go to the northeastern pen in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, didn't really work out too well. He's bringing too much publicity. People are, the warden doesn't want him around because he feels this is getting just crazy. There's thoughts of moving gas to gas into Alcatraz at one point, uh, but never gets there. They send him to Leavenworth, and Gaston at this point's losing everything. He's going to take a couple last cracks at anything. So he's going to try to bribe a guard and tells the warden, uh, he wants the guard to tell the warden that government officials came to that guard and says, I need to talk to Gaston immediately, uh, and don't know how that was going to work. He offers more files that don't exist to the government. He claims that he kidnapped the Lindbergh baby. Then he claims that Mrs. Lindbergh's family hired him to kidnap the baby. But the baby got injured, so Gaston had to kill him. <coughs> then he claims that he has a high, blood pr high brain blood pressure, and that's because he fell off that Pullman car so long ago, and that the government needs to pay for a surgery for him in Washington, D.C., and then afterwards he'll get a parole. And then he starts telling when I'll give everyone McLean's money back, but it's in a pipe that I secured to a grappling hook in the Potomac River. And they actually look for it. 
and they can't find it. So he's, he's grasping at straws at this point. He, his health is failing. Um, on the right, you can see the northeastern pen on the top, and on the bottom is the Atlanta pen, where he's going to spend, uh, I mean, Leavenworth, where he's going to spend the last years of his life. Um, he's going to have these gallstone attacks and issues, and this is going to result in him requiring surgery. He's going to be so delusional that they force him to have surgery. Um, that's going to be on December 7th. By December 9th, his heart starts slowing down and failing. By no December 12th, he is dead. He has a heart attack. Julie means Cain, according to her story. Her grandmother said that while visiting Gaston in his last couple of days of life, she was allowed in the, the cell with Gaston, but wasn't allowed to be in there alone. And that she said that all these people that were doctors didn't look like doctors, that they, she thought that they were government officials and agents acting like they were doctors to see if they can get any information or do anything like that. So not sure how true that is. But Gaston's last few days was writing letters to people saying, this is how I, I, I got money, this is how I'm going to get off, this is what you're going to do tells Julie that you need to do this to get me money to get out. And poor Julie is trying to support her family on her own. She's a store clerk, a teacher. She's bouncing around, and it's getting really rough. Gaston's body is returned to Concord, North Carolina, and buried December 15, 1938, which is the exact 21st anniversary of the Maude King acquittal when he got off for murder. So the question always ended up, what happened to the $100,000 of uh, Evelyn Walsh McLean? And no one could ever find it. So that money supposedly went somewhere, but that's been the big mystery of where it went. And I'm hoping that maybe Julie Means Cain knows something, but she's offered to give me more information, and this is not a joke, offered to give me more information if we flew her out here to talk to you guys today and we paid her. <laughs> so take that for what it's worth. <laughs> and it was also the same for me getting any more information or photos from her, and she also tried to barter with me of giving her more information of other stuff. So it's kind of an interesting thing how genetics works. Uh, but that ends the life of poor Gaston Means, and you can see by the end when the, the newspaper saying that Means Master Swindler dies, and that's one of the last photos of him. He's looking a little rough for wear. But that is the condensed version of the life of Gaston Means. And like I said, there's so much more, but that's my best I can do of squeezing it into exactly 65 minutes. So I'll be happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. She didn't get, she got very little. I don't know exact amounts of what he got because I know he was earning residuals well after, so I don't have an exact number on that one, but I know it was well into the, I believe it was up to six digits. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. A little bit of the family, but he also kept on having little nest eggs of money floating around that he would pull out out of nowhere. Um, and actually, by the last time he was bailed out, it was a $25,000 bail. He had to produce 5000 at first, and the judge says, I don't trust it. I want four different bail bondsmen to cover you. So he ended up having to pay $20,000 to what turned into a total of a $100,000 bond to get him out. Um, so he pulled money out of thin air, which people are saying that he had it tucked away, and that's why they think this hundred grand of Evelyn Walsh McLean exists somewhere. If you go by his stories, there's supposedly a pipe in his backyard that he tucked money down into six feet underground, and you can find it if you have a hook and all this. Don't know. But money exists somewhere when you're gasping means. <laughs> yes, sir. He, it's because while well, he was a German spy, the United States hadn't entered the war yet. So in his mind, we're good. And the part that was also kind of interesting is Gaston Means was employed by the Germans, and his boss, Bill Burns, was employed by the British. And the two of them would actually sit together and swap information to see how they can make the most money off of it with one another. It, like I said, it's a complicated story. <laughs> And that's why I, I feel like the, the time I, sp I explained it, and I know parts of it was getting kind of weird, confusing, and running on, doesn't do it justice for how complicated this is, believe me. Yeah. He was, but that didn't really have much to play into this. Oh yeah, Lindbergh was kind of pushed to the side being pro-Nazi for a little while as well. Not yet. Fantastic. Why, uh, I, I see in some of the videos, sometimes he's out 
Thank you. Thank you very much. sad thing is it's probably one of the more minor things he did yeah. was that book of all things but it's something we're still living with today yeah. was because of that book It's an interesting read, I'll tell you. It's, it's, uh, it's a it's great bathroom reading for one of two different reasons. <laughs> and uh, but if you take it into consent that he is over exaggerating everything and he wants the the lore of look how great I am, that book speaks to him of every level of how amazing I am and look at what I'm doing because I'm going to the White House and I'm talking to Florence and I watched war and yell at her and I oh none of it's true. Not a single bit of it. And that was more just about oh. these people that knew who he was as a person. You know, that's what this whole book is about. The, the class of people that he took on during the war. And so, you know, I think, you know, you guys all should feel a better knowing that I'm reading a book that you feel like you can trust and that you can really trust and that you can rely on. Um, our uh, next reader is a new reader. Um, she wrote in to say that she wants to read Mary Laura. Oh, 
there will also be scheduled at some point throughout the year, uh, we're hoping to schedule a restoration tour or two or three. So keep your eyes peeled for that. That'll be an exciting chance to see what's all going on in there. Thank you.